Every once in a while, I get this urge to make an NBA conspiracy theories video, and today I got four of them for you. You guys seem to really enjoy watching them just as much as I enjoy making them. So with that being said, let's get into it. Let's go all the way back to the year 2013, when the six-seeded Golden State Warriors took on the three-seed Denver Nuggets in round one of the playoffs. Denver was the best home team that season, going 38-3 at the Pepsi Center. So after Golden State lost game one and lost David Lee due to an injury, people thought that this was going to be a quick series, but Steph Curry showed why he was a superstar in the making, as the Warriors would win the next three games to take a 3-1 lead in the series. Then game 5 came along, and that's when this conspiracy kicks in. We all know that Andre Iguodala went on to sign with Golden State later that offseason, but was he working for the Warriors before he joined them? I say that because at the time, there were rumors that Iguodala was leaking inside information to Warriors head coach Mark Jackson about how the Nuggets were trying to rough Curry up. I know that's a pretty big claim, but this quote that Jackson gave following Game 5 looks to have supported that theory. Tried to send hitmen on Steph. When you say they sent hitmen at Steph, could you elaborate on that? There were some dirty plays early. Coach, uh, you said that some of the Nuggets tried to hurt Curry. What specifically was happening that you saw? The screen on Curry by the foul line, you know, is a shot at his ankle. I've got inside information that some people don't like that brand of basketball. And they clearly didn't co-sign it. So they wanted to let me know that they had no parts in, in what was taking place. And many believed that he was alluding to Andre Iguodala. Basically, it was believed that Iggy secretly approached Jackson and said that his team, meaning the Nuggets, were targeting Curry. But he wanted to let Jackson know that he wanted no part of it. And the person that accused Iggy of going behind the Nuggets' back was, of course, none other than the Nuggets' coach at the time, George Carl, who said that there was no question that Iguodala was Jackson's mole. Carl went on Tim Kawakami's podcast and was asked about Iggy. Quote, Kawakami, did you have any issue with Iguodala being close to the Warriors, and then he ends up signing with the Warriors? Is that an issue in your mind at all? Carl, yeah, I don't know what the real story is, but there were things there that we saw in film. There was something with Mark Jackson and him that was fishy. It had a bad odor to it. It was negative energy. He went on to say that the team gradually figured it out that Iggy was kind of favoring Jackson. Combine that with the fact that Iggy was seen praying with the Warriors before each game of that series, and the fact that the Warriors owner, Joe Lacob, said that Iggy's cousin sat behind him during that series and went out of his way to let him know that Iggy really likes the organization is a pretty clear indication that Iggy had his eye on the Warriors. Once again, George Carl thought it was fishy that Iggy went and signed with Golden State a few months later. You could say that it wasn't really a good look for Iggy to deliver inside information to the opposite team, but he was just looking out for Curry at the end of the day. If anything, it actually wasn't a good look for Carl if the claims were true that the Nuggets were trying to intentionally hurt Curry. Even Curry himself felt that something was going on. Quote, I'm going through the paint minding my own business, and they're coming out of nowhere trying to throw elbows. They've got a hit on me, I don't know what it is. Curry suffered a sprained ankle and an ugly poke to the eye during that series, so that should tell you something. I mean, you can clearly see Kenneth Fareed sticking out his leg to try and trip Curry as he's going through the lane. And as for Iggy, he actually played very well for Denver that series, so take that as you will. The New Orleans Pelicans look to have also found a rather different way to defend Steph Curry back on May 4th, 2021. 
With about four minutes left in the third quarter, Golden State leading 77 to 71, Curry was just about to shoot a three-pointer when suddenly the lights went out in the Smoothie King Center. Here comes Steph. These scattered situations. He shot the lights out. The, the Pelicans trying to turn. That's a different way to defend Curry right there <laughs> is turn the power off when the Warriors have the ball. Of course, everybody immediately went to the joke. Oh, look, he literally shot the lights out. You know, trying to make light of the situation. But what if there was more behind this blackout? First of all, he really was figuratively shooting the lights out before that, knocking down eight three-pointers up until that point. But following the lights going out, he, along with the entire Warriors team, went completely cold. Here's a graphic of what I'm talking about. Curry scored only two more points, going 1 of 11 from the field, 0 and 6 from beyond the arc. Curry did end up with 37 points that game, but again, most of that came before the lights turned off. You see how the momentum just totally shifted from that point on? The staff that were working at the arena that night said that it was just a brief technical error. I mean, yeah, that definitely could have been a possibility, but the effect it had on the game greatly favored the Pelicans. Had the shot gone in, or in other words, had the lights not malfunctioned, preventing Curry from seeing and possibly making it, their lead would have extended to 9, but instead they ended up losing by 5. It went down to the wire, so you can't help but to think how much of a difference that potentially made. Just look at this graphic again if you need more convincing that the power outage did in fact have an impact. Now, am I saying that the Pelicans somehow did this on purpose to throw Curry off? Well, if they did, it clearly worked. Even Curry noticed a difference between pre-lights going out and post-lights going out. Steph, I'm just curious if that's the first time in your career a team has knocked the lights out to try and slow you down a little bit. Yeah, I hadn't seen that one before. They tried to get me saying I shot it before the lights went out, but it's a weird situation because we were flowing a little bit. I guess kind of after that, it was it's kind of a rough offensive situation, but it wasn't as long as that one that happened in the Super Bowl that one year. But uh, it was uh, it was kind of weird just in general. It's interesting because that Super Bowl 47 incident he was referring to also coincidentally took place in New Orleans, where the momentum happened to totally change in that game as well as a result. So either they need to fix their electrical situation, or they must get a kick out of messing with us. Now, believe it or not, we might have yet another situation where it looked like Curry was potentially targeted. A pretty scary moment took place during this past opening night between the Lakers and Warriors on October 19th, 2021. It was in the third quarter when Curry was seen slipping on some liquid and falling to the ground on the sidelines after attempting a three in the corner. Apparently, a drink had been spilled and not cleaned up. Floyd Mayweather and Rap Kid Cudi both had a front row seat to the incident, but due to proximity, many only pointed the finger at Kid Cudi, accusing him for, I guess, putting the liquid there. Yeah, I know, it sounds ridiculous to even suggest he would do something like that, but seriously, this was a huge deal. Or at least on Twitter it was. Take a look at these series of tweets. Quote, Kid Cudi almost being responsible for a Steph Curry broken ankle is not what I was expecting when I woke up today. Kid Cudi's response was, that was not me. He would also go on to say, to Steph Curry, I'm so sorry you slipped, it wasn't me. The conversation continues, who spilled the drink though, we need to know. These people a couple seats down from me. People kept walking in it and it spread. Shit was everywhere. I put my drink under my seat off the floor to specifically avoid this situation. Even though we can all agree that it was completely unfair to blame him, I guess I can somewhat understand their concern, because that could have cost him the whole season if it had gone wrong, but luckily he only suffered a small cut. I mean, I guess it was also kinda suspicious that he was seen wearing an entire Toon Squad Space Jam 2 uniform on top of the fact that he's literally from Cleveland, but that's neither here nor there. 
Kobe Bryant's last ever game of his legendary career will forever be remembered as a special night. But there was a theory going around that the reason he was able to drop 60 was because the Utah Jazz purposely took it easy on him, being his final game and all, just letting him score. While interesting, there's no way we can know for sure if that was the case. Unless of course those Jazz players back then happened to come out and confess. But Mike Tirico had a theory of his own while speaking to Ryan Russillo of The Ringer. Tirico believed that Gordon Hayward intentionally stepped into the lane during Kobe's last trip at the free throw line. Let's have him explain it. He hits the first one for 59. He's at the line the second time. And you've got to watch on the free throw line closest to Kobe, back to the camera, is Gordon Hayward. Gordon Hayward steps into the lane as Kobe's about to shoot that last free throw for 60 in case he missed it to give him another shot for 60. It was like Gordon Hayward, his team losing in this game. They blew a lead, blah, 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 blah. He had the complete wherewithal at 59 to just put a foot in the lane and look over at the ref just in case Kobe missed it. But Hayward denied that that was his intentions. Quote, It has come to my attention that there's a story going around tonight about an intentional lane violation that I took to ensure Kobe would get his 60th point in his final game. And many are applauding me for the gesture. The fact of the matter is, that is not true. That was a night that I will truly never forget, as I can remember almost every moment of it. And my goal that night was to compete as hard as I possibly could against Kobe because that is what he was all about, and I wanted to give him my very best. He got 60 on me, and I didn't give him anything free all night. What happened on the free throw line was not intentional. Kobe would have lost respect for me if I gave him something free. That's what made him so very special. 